Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In the summer, I worked on a buffalo ranch near the town of Du Bois, Idaho. The ranch itself sits about 30 miles outside of Du Bois, near the Continental Divide. I'm an avid fisherman, and after working long days on the ranch, I would spend many evenings fly fishing along Medicine Lodge Creek. One night, as I was fishing, a rainstorm quickly moved in over the divide, as is common in the summer months. I decided to start walking back to the ranch to avoid getting soaked. I'd been fishing on the opposite side of the river from the ranch and therefore had to cross back through the river to return home. I walked the banks of the river for a few minutes in order to find an ideal crossing spot. I finally found a break in the willows and started wading across the river. By this time, it had started to rain, and a cold, dreary feeling had set in over the river. As I was wading across the river, I saw a slight movement above me in the river. I turned my head and froze immediately. At first, I thought I was looking at a moose or even a bear, which are both common to the area. The creature was probably 200 feet above me in the river. I was scared to death and could not move. Then the unthinkable happened. The creature, which had previously been hunched over slightly, stood up on two legs and looked directly at me. It was then that it occurred to me that I was looking at the infamous Sasquatch. One of the things I remember that was striking was how human the creature's face was. It was much darker, obviously, but very much human. It had broad shoulders, although so do I. I'm about six foot six and 300 pounds. I have recounted this story to many people who have joked that I saw my reflection in the river. I remember thinking that the Sasquatch was not as hairy as I would have thought and that it was not as tall as I'd ever imagined. After what seemed an eternity, the Sasquatch started to walk into the willows. As soon as I saw movement, I began to run across the river as fast as I could in waders and in water. When I got to the bank, I took a glance behind me to make sure the Sasquatch hadn't circled around to come after me. After seeing that it hadn't, I took off my waders and sprinted back to the ranch. I will never forget this experience. I have had many friends try and discount it and talk me out of what I saw. I will never change my story. It was dusk. It was raining, but it was still late afternoon with enough light to still see. The area was a creek bottom with willows. On to the next one. In Clark County in Idaho, I have spent many hours hunting in the western U.S. I don't spook easy. I always hunt until dark and walk out at night. I have seen and shot most big game animals. I know their tracks and their vocal sound. I was bow hunting with a friend near Crooked Creek. We decided to camp at an old warm springs area where we could wash up. We hit the sack at about 10 p.m. We were in the bed of my pickup talking. It was a bright, full moon. You could see 80 to 100 yards with the bright moon. My buddy rose up and started looking and said, there's somebody behind that cottonwood tree. I said, yeah, right. He said, no, I'm serious. Then I could tell he was. I rose up, and about 20 yards away, I saw somebody or something look out from behind this cottonwood tree. 
The only weapon we had was a bow and arrow, and I didn't feel real safe. I said real loud, grab your gun, and then I repeated, we've got guns. The two-legged creature peeked out from behind the tree and then ran ten feet over to the next cottonwood tree and hid behind it. I knew there were no people camped within miles, and nobody was that stupid to mess with hunters with guns. We both jumped from the pickup bed, threw our coolers in, and drove 25 miles to sleep the rest of the night. I decided to share this when I heard about other Clark County sightings a few months ago that were only eight miles from this location. I told my best friend, who also hunts in the same area, and he and his brothers had an encounter very similar to ours in the same place a few years earlier. It was approximately 1 a.m. The area was creek bottom in cottonwood trees. On to the next one. In Cassia County in Idaho, it was just myself. I was cutting firewood and had blocked the wood to fill the truck. I shut the saw off and started loading the truck. I had the truck almost loaded when I smelled something that really stunk and I thought it was a dead cow. You find them in the mountains sometimes and I go and check out to see what it is. Well, this time I said dead cow and kept loading the truck. Then it dawned on me, how come I didn't smell it earlier? I stopped and looked around. There it was. That's when I saw a Sasquatch walking up a small hill out of the ravine. It put its hand on a tree like a tired old man would do and kept walking. It scared me just to see. I finished the truck pretty fast and was glad when I did. I left not to go back for over a year later. I had a gun in the front of the truck and a chainsaw, but you forget about them in a situation like that. It didn't even turn around and look at me or come toward me. At work, I told two guys, and they started making fun of it, so I stopped telling anybody. I came home and told my wife, and she says, I believe you saw something, but I don't believe in Sasquatch. Since then, I've talked to other people. Those who have seen it won't say much because they're afraid to be teased or made fun of. It was between 12 and 3, give or take an hour. It was a clear and warm day. On to the next one. Saturday, September 8th, 1883. The Saturday Herald Decatur, Illinois, a roaming madman, startling experiences of an Illinois lady with a wild man, as naked as the day he was born. Centerville, Illinois, on September 4th, a wild man, as naked as Adam, has been roaming around the country in this vicinity for several days, causing intense excitement and consternation among the farmer's family. His long, tangled beard and matted hair his tall, athletic form and the fierce look out of his eyes make him an exceedingly unpleasant person to meet in a lonely spot. He is begrimed with dirt from head to foot, for he never gets a bath except when it rains or when necessity compels him to wade a creek in search of prey. He has been seen by the wife of Dr. John Saltenberger, who lives about three miles west of this place. Mrs. Saltenberger was returning home shortly after nightfall and was near the Stetzel Ride farm. The wild man crept stealthily out of the orchard and, when near the buggy, made a rush to stop the horse. The lady gave the animal a frantic cut with the whip and he bounded along the road at a furious pace, but almost before she had recovered her breath, the wild man had overtaken her and leapt into the vehicle from behind. He uttered not a word and seemed immediately to become as badly frightened as the lady herself. He sprang down and ran repeatedly toward the woods. A telephone message was sent to Belleville yesterday asking the sheriff to come and capture the creature. 
Young men of the settlement are searching the woods in every direction today, but some of them are not over-anxious to encounter the monster. Superstitious persons declare it to be the ghost of one of the Stetzel Reed family, five of whom were murdered and robbed about eight years ago. Others are puzzled to decide whether it is the missing link or an escaped lunatic. Friday, December 4th, 1891. Decatur Daily Republican. The Wild Man Hunt. A systematic hunt for the wild man who roams about in London and Carson Township, Fayette County, is to take place on December 5th. A circle of searchers, about four miles in circumference, is to be thrown around the supposed haunt of the queer being in the Oka Bottom, hunting toward the center. Some time ago, an insane man was found in these bottoms, and for a time, it was thought he was the person who had been taking the poultry and pigs in the neighborhood, but it was found that it was a mistake and the wild man was still at large. On to the next one. Thursday, February 2nd, 1922. New Oxford item, Pennsylvania. Wild man lives alone in cave, makes night raids on neighboring farms, and carries away animals. Fights with hunters, one hand-to-hand -hand encounter with man who battled him in his cave in an effort to win reward. Mount Sterling, Illinois. A wild man in a cave near here is thwarting all effort of police and armed citizens to capture him, and is keeping the countryside in terror with his raids on outlying farms. A price has been set on his head, but desperate attempts to capture him in his lair have proven vain. The wild man recently made a series of bold robberies near Mount Pleasant, carrying off calves and sheep to a deserted mine where he stays hidden in the daytime. Ambrose Smith, a dead shot and tireless hunter, was seriously wounded in a terrific hand-to-hand -hand encounter with the mysterious man-monster. He is a huge creature with bony hands. The wild man has long, wiry hair that bristles about his savage-looking face. Smith sat in his home where he is recovering from the adventure. In the uncertain light of the cavern, I made him out to be a great towering creature. His hands are thin and the flesh is stretched over the bones like leather. People feared black damp in the long empty galleries of the mine, so much that even a reward of five hundred dollars for the wild man, dead or alive, failed to result in his apprehension. At last, Smith, accompanied by J. M. Blair and others from Mount Pleasant, all quick with a gun, went to the cave. It was late in the afternoon. Smith had the others stand back 200 yards from the mouth of the cave and entered alone, armed with only his large hunting knife. His dog followed him, fought for an hour in the damp cave. Night fell, and the watchers waited in vain for Smith to return. Then there was a great noise, and the dog ran out whimpering. The men went into the cavern in search of Smith. They groped along through the twisting passageways in the darkness, but were unable to find any trace of him. At midnight, Smith crawled from the cave on his hands and knees and fell faint and exhausted at the feet of his friend. I did not get more than fifty feet into the cave, boys, he said, as they carried him to the doctors. When I saw the wild man glaring at me a few feet away, he then sprang at me, and held me in a steel-like grip. I tried to knife him, but he held my wrist. For more than an hour, we fought together on the wet floor of the cave. I weakened, and he slipped from my grip. I felt his hot breath on my face, and then a heavy blow on my head knocked me unconscious. I don't know what happened after that. When I get well, I'll make another attempt, and next time, I'll get him. On to the next one. This is near Franceville in Holliski County in Indiana. My friend and I were going for a walk and we came across a bare footprint. 
It wouldn't have seemed odd, but it was in the melting snow and it was the only one we could see. We ran to my parents and told them what we found and we brought a tape measure and took a Polaroid picture of it. It only measured 13 to 14 inches long, which is not very long at all, but it did seem wide. I don't know how significant this information is, but you never know. It was near the trailer park where people lived, and there was no one living in the campers that were there in the winter. The footprint was headed back toward the forest. I can't remember all of who were there, but there were at least four of us. We found it in the morning, and it was pretty cold and dreary. The footprint was melting and icy. The place is surrounded by wood and fields, and the highway is nearby. On to the next one. We still do a lot of camping in this area and have never heard a noise quite since. This was near Centerville in Wayne County in Indiana. My buddy and I do extensive camping in this area and were raised here. We have heard many strange noises, but on this particular night, we were camping in an old corn crib and around 2 p.m., we heard a very loud growling, hollering noise that woke us both up from our sleep. We both looked at each other in disbelief, but decided to not let that bother us and go back to sleep. Within a few minutes, we heard the same noise again, only this time louder and much closer. We have heard coyotes and screech owls, but we have never heard anything even remotely similar to this sound. The next day, while sitting safely in our homes, we discussed what we had heard and thought about Bigfoot. But who had ever heard of a Bigfoot in Indiana? Everything seemed normal prior to our nighttime visit. There were just the two of us, and we were both sound asleep. It occurred around 2 a.m. at night. It was extremely dark. The noise was in the woods. We could not see anything, only the noises we heard and the hair on the back of our necks were standing. The environment consists mainly of hard wood with intermittently corn and soybean fields. The woods are mostly underdeveloped due to deep ravines. Small areas of the wood are a little swampy with intermittent patches of pine wood. A few years back, a local family were all riding their dirt bikes in the woods, and one of the bikes became disabled, so everyone stopped to work on the bike at which time they saw a creature watching them from a distance that appeared to be tall and hairy. On to the next one. In Harrison County in Indiana. My name is Dawn. I lived with my brother in a small A-frame cabin on Corydon Ridge Road in Corydon. It started with hearing sounds, howling screams in the woods behind the house. It scared the heck out of us and our dogs, but we blew it off until it happened again. Being young and very stupid at the time, I was 20. I got the brilliant idea of shooting into the woods from where the sound came from. From that night till we moved out about two weeks later, we would hear the screams getting closer. We kept shooting up in the air and out into the woods about 200 yards away. The screams would stop after five to ten shots, but they would start a night or two later. My friend James came over and camped back in the woods. He was only there for several hours. He said he saw something humanoid, hairy, and tall walk between two trees. He left shortly thereafter. The next night, my brother woke up to a large shape staring at him in the window. It had to be at least eight feet tall. The next night, my friend Mike stayed over out of disbelief. That is when it howled. It sounded like it was in the house. It was so loud. It was right under my window. My bedroom was upstairs. We went out the next day, but there were no tracks. But the back step, wood two by eight, two of them had been caved in from something heavy enough to break the door jam. The knob was not hurt. The door lock was still locked. It was pushed with so much force it splintered the frame where the bolt meant the wood. My dogs were cowering upstairs. 
They messed all over upstairs. They wouldn't even come to me. The house was not touched inside. It smelled like feces, skunky, wet hair, and urine. It is hard to describe. It wasn't overpowering. It was just strong. I moved out the next day. No one would believe me, so I've only told a few people. I've asked the local people about it. They all said I was nuts, or they would slam the door in my face. Some people bought the place a few years later. It was a rental when I was there. I thought it was odd they disassembled the tiny cabin and hauled it off in a flatbed truck, and they sold the land. There is a large brick home there today. It was in woods near a forestry with a lot of sinkholes and caves. On to the next one. Hidden in the wild of Morgan Monroe State Forest is a body of water called Lost Lake. Even the locals have trouble finding it. There is no road to it. A group of three men raccoon hunted this area regularly and had for over 25 years. They drove in so far and hiked the final half mile to the lake. Their raccoon dog seemed to get very excited as they approached the hidden lake and the men figured there had to be raccoons everywhere. One of the men that had one of the dogs pulling very hard on its lead kept thinking that something in the forest was following them. Finally, the men decided it was time to let the dogs go before they went crazy. The moment the dogs were released, there was a loud crack that came out of the forest right behind them. When they turned around to see what had made the noise, they were about 15 feet away from what had to be the largest man they had ever seen. Covered with hair, the man was about nine feet tall and was staring them down, and it was not at all afraid of the three men. The three men stood motionless and watched as it simply turned around and walked into the darkness of the forest. The men finally got their dogs called in and very quickly hiked back to their truck. They never hunted this area again and said they would never return to Lost Lake day or night. On to the next one. Near Austin in Scott County in Indiana. Take the I-65 to Austin. Go west on 256. Turn left on Boatman Road. Turn right on York Street, follow the road until it turns into gravel and then dead end at the river in the middle of a field. It is deep wood on the right off Boatman Road, I-65. It was bow season in October, around 5.30 in the evening. I had just climbed out of my deer stand and heard movement about 20 meters in front of my stand. So I decided to just sit at the base of the tree to see if the deer would come out of the brush and hopefully get a shot at it. After waiting for about 10 minutes, it got pretty dark in the woods. Too dark to take a shot. So instead of spooking the deer, I decided to wait for it to move out so that I might have another chance at it the next day. It was making a lot of noise, kind of unusual for deer. I must have sat there for another 20 minutes when I heard this loud, high-pitched scream or howl. It lasted for about three to four seconds, and it was very close to my left. Needless to say, it scared the crap out of me. I have never heard anything like that before. I grew up around the woods, and I have been hunting for many years, and never heard that sound before or since. I have been in the military for 16 years, and spent my share in many different types of wilderness, and this sound that I heard I will never forget. It was between 6 and 6.30 p.m. and dark in the woods, but you could just see the sky through the treetop, and it was around 55 degrees. The area is called the Austin Bottoms because it is always flooded. Thousands of acres of wood, a lot of farmland, many branches of the Muscat River run through it with lots of game. On to the next one. On Youth Camp Road, around the Bartholomew Brown County line, west of Columbus, Indiana. Youth Camp Road is about four miles south of State Road 46 that connects Columbus to Nashville, Indiana. Columbus is about six miles east of the siding. 
the sighting was witnessed by my brother and a friend. My brother told me of the sighting shortly after it happened. He has retold it to me a few times over the years. The story is always the same and never changes. My brother was in high school at the time and he had been at a party. The party was supervised by parents at a friend's house, so there was no drinking involved. His friend was driving the family van. After the party, the two boys drove a girl home that lived west of Columbus around the Youth Camp Road area. After dropping the girl off, the boys proceeded east on the road, back towards State Road 46. My brother states that something crossed the road about 50 to 80 yards in front of the van. He said it walked out of the woods on the left side of the road, crossed the road, and entered the woods again on the right side. He said the headlight caught a glimpse of it as it was re-entering the woods on the right side of the road. He said it was completely white and furry. He said that they drove for about five minutes in silence without stopping. After about five minutes, my brother's friend said, what the heck was that? My brother said, I don't know. I was afraid to say anything because I thought it might have just been my imagination. According to my brother, this is the exact dialogue spoken. He said it was big, tall, and covered in white fur. He told me that he didn't see it clear enough to tell if it was Bigfoot-like or humanoid, although he said it was about six feet tall and walking upright on two legs. We were traveling in a van, listening to music and talking. The Youth Camp Road area is heavily wooded area with houses sprinkled along the road. Most of these homes are very nice and well built. If you are traveling west towards the youth camp, the road becomes very hilly and curvy after entering the wooded area. In the wintertime, the road becomes very hazardous to travel. The road leads west to youth camp. This camp has a really nice home at the entrance. The campground has several shelter houses for various activities. The camp also has a small lake. Inside the camp is an old bridge along the foot trails that fell down. From the new bridge, you can see a sign nailed to the old bridge that states Bigfoot tore it down. At least it did years ago when I was a kid. Youth Camp Road also crosses the Bartholomew Brown County line. Brown County is famous for its heavily wooded state park. The Brown County landscape is very hilly. There are several streams in the area. Also, Youth Camp Road is in between two large lakes, Harrison Lake and Grandview Lake. The road that the sighting occurred on is very dark and creepy at night. On to the next one. In the backwaters of Lake Monroe and the Hoosier National Forest near Elkinville in Brown County in Indiana, my cousin and I were camping way out in the woods. We had just got there and built a fire when we heard a scream up on the ridge. After we heard the scream, we shot our 12-gauge shotgun into the air and saw the creature's outline from the moonlight. It was standing upright like a human, running down the water's edge, making a howling noise never heard before in either of our lives. We saw something that looked like a large footprint, but we weren't sure. We were setting up camp and getting ready to eat. On to the next one. There was a time when I was growing up in northern Minnesota during the Korean War that the military stationed a volunteer group of plane spotters in more remote areas to report any aircraft flying over. In our area, there were some valuable targets around Lake Superior and the rest of the Great Lakes. America has those paranoid spells where the enemy is all over, even the most remote places. My grandfather was one of those volunteers who spent long hours in a specially constructed and concealed observation tower erected by the military. He had an airplane observer's guide that gave every description, photos, markings, and all details of the underside of bombers and fighters the enemy were using. Whenever he saw a plane or planes, he would use his super powerful binoculars to confirm the aircraft type and then call in his report on what type how many, and the exact direction they were headed. 
During the long hours of very boring time, he had to stay alert, so he watched the wildlife in the area. This tower took a long time to climb up, and so it wasn't a matter of a quick trip up, and since the tower was within a hundred yards of a beautiful lake, and there was a large city property and park on the lakeshore, the observation tower off into the forest was well hidden even from the ground because of the forested area all around. The staff watch were known by the local resident to inhabit the area, but just beyond the tower and between the forest and the lake was a massive swamp. Since it was rumored to have quicksand on the bottom, my friends and I steered clear of the place. There were too many nice areas for us to play in. Grandfather said that one day he happened to be watching a white-tailed doe and her fawn grazing on plants on the dry ground when a huge sasquatch came running out of the trees and swooped up that fawn with a big paw and in less than three seconds had broken its neck. Granddad said the doe made an effort to protect her baby and reared up on her hind legs, but the sasquatch just threw a kick at her chest in a sweeping motion that caught her with his heel and knocked her into a large pine tree. He said she just lay there, unable to move, and then the sasquatch stepped quickly over and broke her neck as well. Then Grandfather heard an aircraft and jumped to his binoculars to call in his report, and by the time he was able to check on the scene on the ground, the Sasquatch was carrying the fawn and dragging the doe, and he only saw them as they entered the bushy forest and disappeared. Gramps said he didn't realize that the Sasquatch ate meat. He was quite surprised at that. So later that day, while his relief spotter arrived, he decided to see if he could follow the animal track. Having only seen one other of the elusive Sasquatch as a quick flash, when he was deer hunting, this was quite exciting. So, he said, he stuck his revolver in his pocket and followed the mental picture he had remembered from his view in the tower, making it through and around with still dry thought. Grandfather said it was only about an hour later when he finally located the trail, and following it, he first saw the doe's foot sticking up from behind a log, and the Sasquatch had evidently covered her with dead leaves and grasses. Grandfather saw where the trail continued, and then he spotted movement up ahead. So, he slowly weighed down and walked painfully bent over, getting closer until he was behind a balsam tree, which he cautiously edged into, so he could be hidden from sight. As he kneeled down on the dead pine needle, making for a soundless observation post, the next thing was totally beyond anything he had ever heard of. There lay the fawn, its entrails protruding from its split open belly and the Sasquatch was squatting over a dirt bank that hung partially over the lake and it was fishing. There, tied to a stick, the Sasquatch had its left paw with a long string of the fawn's intestines and the motionless Sasquatch held what appeared to be a multi-pointed spear-like stick in its right paw. Then, in an almost imperceptible motion that didn't even make a splash, the animal jabbed the stick in and up it came with a fish. That's when Granddad said the Sasquatch quickly pulled the fish off the stick and laid it down on a pile of what must have been three or four other fish, whose tails flipped up as the new arrival landed among them. Grandfather told me that he continued to watch as the animal periodically reached inside the fawn's open intestinal tract and replaced the bait on its strange-looking spear and continued to fish. Grandfather said he got bored, so he very carefully backed away and returned to his car. The next day, he didn't have observer duty, so he returned to the same place, going very slowly and carefully, but the animal was not in sight. He did say he found two more Sasquatch tracks in the sand by the shore, and the skeletons of about a dozen fish that all the meat had been taken off of. The doe was still lying there, but her intestines had been removed, and Grandfather was now back to still not knowing but doubting that the Sasquatch ate meat. Fish, yes, but he told me that he discussed the matter with his hunting club and none of them had seen any evidence of the big fellows eating meat, which they all agreed on though, was the fact that Sasquatch loved fish. It appeared that the big guy had apparently killed the fawn for being able to use his intestines to bait the fish. The doe was an added benefit, but her internals were only lightly used 
Perhaps because the larger gut were too big for the small mouth of the fish, Grandfather said that all of the planes he reported, he was pretty sure none had been an enemy. I had his permission to climb up the old observation tower before they took it down, but I never went any higher than about 30 feet. Way too scary. On to the next one. In Calhoun County in Alabama, there were several reports of hairy humanoid in a swamp near Anniston. Sheriff W.P. Cotton led a posse to look for the beast, which was reported to be accompanied by a female of the same species as well as a child. The male was five feet tall and had hair all over his unclothed body. Around the same time, a farmer named Rex Biddle saw a male hairy humanoid approach his home. Rex reached for his gun, but did not shoot the beast as he did not know if it was legal to. He appeared to be too human. Roy Biddle stated that the male hairy humanoid followed him for a while, then dropped to all fours and chased his pet dog into the swamp. He was definite that it was not a bear. On to the next one. When I was about eight or ten years old, I saw a Bigfoot. It was during the summer on Green Mountain near Huntsville in Madison County in Alabama. It was unpopulated then. Now there are million dollar homes there. I was on my way home from my uncle's house on a gravel road. I was on one side of a hill. The road went down this hollow and back up the other side. In the ditch line was a Bigfoot, about eight feet tall, with arms that looked like they reached down past his knees. It was slightly leaned forward, looking straight at me. It scared the daylights out of me. So I went back to my uncle's house and told him. He got his shotgun and we went back. It was still there looking at us. Uncle Ike threw the gun to shoot and I told him we needed to get closer. So we went down the hill, and as we did, we lost sight. When we got back up the other side, it was gone. My aunt used to come to our house complaining about noises, and hearing what she thought were panthers screaming. It was an afternoon with clear, warm sunshine. Green Mountain has a lot of caves in the backside that, to my knowledge, are still unexplored. On to the next one. Near Abbeville in Alabama, there was an interesting sighting. When my aunt was about 11 or 12 years old, she was helping her older cousin Jerry in the field at her aunt's house in an area called Greemer in Henry County, Alabama. It was a hot day, and after some time, Jerry grew very thirsty and asked my aunt to walk up the road to the house and get him a glass of water. My aunt then walked through the field back toward the dirt road leading to her aunt's house. Upon reaching the dirt road, she saw two creatures standing on the other side of the road. She stopped and began slowly backing up, then stopped again. She stood there looking at them, and they looking at her for a minute or so long enough for her to get a good look at them. They were only around 10 feet away from her at that point. She on one side of the dirt road and they on the other. She described them as standing next to each other. One was, in her estimation, around five feet tall and the other was slightly shorter at around four feet tall. She said, that she got the impression that they were young. She said that they were real hairy and completely covered in dark brownish black hair. That they looked sort of like gorillas, but with human looking faces with hair on them, human looking hands, and human looking feet. She said their noses were free of hair and that the color of their noses was dark brown or black as were their feet and hands. She stood very still, other than blinking, 
just looking at her. Except for the being covered in thick hair, their faces looked human with regular human-looking noses. After a minute or so, she took off running as fast as she could back up to the house to get the water Jerry had requested. She did not look back as she ran. She got the water and proceeded to walk back toward the field. The creatures were not there anymore. She never told anyone about this incident for many years because she was always afraid people would make fun of her. At the time of the sighting, there was only one house along that road, and the road was not paved. It was a dirt country road. The side of the road where the Bigfoots were seen standing together was extremely dense forestry and trees for miles and miles. The opposite side of the road was a large cornfield where the witness and her cousin were working, putting soda on the corn, slang for fertilizing the corn. For the witness's aunt, who owned the cornfield, her cousin still lives there and in the same house where he lived at the time of the sighting. On to the next one. In Aliceville, in Pickens County, this happened in June. I was born and raised in Aliceville, Alabama, about a quarter of a mile from the city park. Years ago, when I was 14 years old, I played in the woods south of the park and swam in the creek nearly every day. One afternoon, just before dark, I had been down near the creek at a small pond. This was before the city built the sewer lagoon on the property. At the time, there was a 20 or so acre sagebrush patch there where they had not cultivated for years. That afternoon, while walking from the lake back across the west end of that field, I saw something walking a path along the eastern end. At first, I thought it to be a huge man. The five-foot-tall sagebrush was striking him about the waist. It was in plain sight for about 50 yards and turned and went back into the woods. It must have been eight feet tall and walked with its head slightly bent forward. It was very dark in color. I could tell it was the same color from the waist to the top of its head. The longer I looked, I knew it wasn't human. I ran home and told my parents, but I don't think they believed me. I never went into those woods alone again until I was much older. It was late afternoon on a clear day on Lubbub Creek, surrounded by pine trees, oak trees, cypress trees, and hickory trees. On to the next one. In Etowah County in Alabama, several people saw an animal resembling a bear that made curious sounds at night like a woman in distress while it ranged up and down Walnut Creek for an area of 10 miles. The creature was larger than a full-grown bear, and bears do not make noises like women screaming. Where had the creature been in the preceding years? Had it just appeared from nowhere like most of our phenomena? On to the next one. A strange creature was still wandering around Walnut Creek. Many witnesses saw a tall, hairy humanoid the locals called a booger, and that made a sound like a woman screaming. The creature had been seen several times in peach orchards sampling the peaches, and it was covered with long hair and left huge man-like tracks. The Reverend E.C. Hand saw it near Liberty Hall and grabbed his shotgun and pursued it. Dogs, though, would not go near it. The hairy beast was said to live in a swamp. Footprints were found, and the booger had only been reported the previous year and would disappear, never to be heard from again, after the following year. On to the next one. A hairy humanoid was seen, and footprints were found, in peach orchards, three miles south of Clanton, near large swamps. The creature was supposed to head for the swamps at night, and left large footprints 
that looked like hands and were seen by many individual witnesses. On to the next one. In Tallapoosa County in Alabama, the witness and a friend were right behind a large reservoir that held water for Russell Mills. We were walking down an old pulpwood road with his German shepherd and got a strong smell like a goat and stopped. I walked ahead about 20 feet and said it might be a big rattlesnake. About that time, I heard leaves rustling and it got louder and a tree about six inches around shook back and forth about two feet each way. I heard the leaves moving like something was running away. I pulled some branches back and there it was about 20 feet running away on two legs at a very fast pace. It was about eight feet tall, and I could see its muscles and its legs moving, and the whitish skin under three inches of black hair, long arms, and no neck as plain as day. My friend never saw it and didn't believe me, but it changed my life. It was about one in the afternoon in an area of pines and bushes near the road, and was swampy down the holler. On to the next one. The new house on Mound Ridge Road in Kentucky seemed perfect at first. The property contained many types of fruit and berry trees, and Dad planned on raising several acres of tobacco come spring. Rose, my mom, looked forward to raising a big vegetable garden. A six kids could play in the big yard or artifact hunt in the many fields along the front and sides of the house. That first spring started out well, despite the steady disappearance of Dad's chickens, which was attributed to weasels and such at first. Then my older brother Dean and myself, ages 10 and 9 respectively, began to find the carcasses of dead dogs in the fields when we were out looking for arrowheads. The bodies were all strangely mutilated, being sliced from the groin to gullet with all the internal organs removed, including the eyes and tongue. No blood or footprints could be seen around these grisly discoveries, even though most were found in open, well-cultivated fields. Also strange was the fact that no scavenger would eat those remains. Not even a fly would land on them to lay its eggs. While we lived there, my family would lose a total of over 200 chickens, one goat, one horse, and find the remains of eight dogs, a pig, and a goat, all mutilated. One day, my parents heard what sounded like something big drinking water from a small creek just inside the woods, out behind the house. By the sound of the loud gulping noises it was making, Dad judged whatever it was to be at least as big as a horse or a cow. Soon afterward, we began to hear strange noises coming from the fields and woods outside. Sometimes they would come from close by, sometimes far away. The two vicious and highly treasured guard dogs that we owned could be heard bumping their heads on the floorboards as they scurried beneath the house in fear of whatever was making the sounds. This caused Dad much concern. As a precaution, when my older brother Harold arrived that spring to add on a bedroom and an indoor bathroom to the house, Dad invited him and his family to move their trailer on out and set it beside the house. As he was suffering from glaucoma and steadily losing his eyesight, he felt that we would be safer with another grown man there who could shoot a gun if need arose. He could also help with raising the tobacco. They moved the trailer in soon after and placed it very close to the house under Dad's direction. One day, a stranger came walking from the far tree line across one of the fields. He was holding a shotgun broken down and walking toward the house, his other hand up in the air in a friendly gesture. It took both the adults to finally calm down the dogs when the stranger approached and introduced himself as Roy, 
a neighbor who lived less than a mile up the road. He told my father that he had just been squirrel hunting in some nearby woods and had scared up something big and hairy that ran away on its hind legs. As it was heading in this direction, and he hadn't the slightest idea what the animal could be or how dangerous it might be, he felt it was his Christian duty to come warn the family about the event. He didn't get a good look at the thing's face, Roy said, but it was big, hairy, and ran away like a man. Dad liked Roy and immediately invited him back for coffee when he had the chance. The two became great friends, and this new acquaintance would play a pivotal role in the drama that was about to unfold. The first sighting by someone in my own family happened at around 8 o'clock one evening, when Mom stepped out onto the front porch to call Harold and his wife and their three children over for late supper. Everyone had been working in the field all day. She looked to her left and saw a giant, hairy shadow, at least eight feet tall, standing in the darkness near an old shed. It was looking at her. She screamed like a panther, then ran back inside and locked the door. Harold soon rushed over, holding his rifle. Dad grabbed the shotgun. Shaking, Mom called the police. After briefly looking around close to the house and finding nothing, the state police left, most probably laughing at the crazy story. But they would be back several more times in the upcoming months as events escalated into an almost nightly visitation by the creature. Eventually, even though it was later learned that the sightings of similar nature were taking place all along the Green River in towns such as Bluff Creek and Hebbardsville, the police refused to respond to any more monster calls and my family was left to defend ourselves. Mom saw it again at dusk. Not long after, it ran from a field by the garden area and jumped an old fence row. It chased Dad and one of the dogs out of a tobacco field that he was tending alone one day. But it was my brother Dean who had the closest encounter. He was standing in the front yard one day trying to take some garden hose away from a couple of the younger girls when he heard a tremendous crashing through the trees out back, followed by a complete and unsettling quiet that came over the entire area. According to him, it was then that he saw the monster standing in a small gully by an old truck. He described it as being muscular and tall, with a square jaw and small, close-set eyes. It was covered in reddish-gray hair, thin and patchy in spots, as if it was very old. All of his children saw it one morning while waiting for the school bus. It was standing in a cornfield out front. It towered above the full-grown corn and seemed to sway slightly from side to side as it stood there. By this time, the local TV news had heard of the events from the police band radio and decided to send a camera crew and sketch artist to our house. The artist drew a hairy, man-like animal with no face, and a segment about the affair was featured on the evening news. The next day, a crew of reporters from the local newspaper descended on our farm to get the scoop. The morning edition of The Gleaner dubbed the Beast the Spotsville Monster, and the accompanying article treated the sighting fairly despite the misquote, such as calling the monster green and misnaming the road which my family lived. Ironically, this sent the crowds of gun-toting monster hunters, which then descended on Spotsville, searching everywhere for a location which did not exist. As I recall, not a single one of them ever made it to our house. Meanwhile, the neighbor from down the road had agreed to try and track the monster down for the sake of the safety of the children. He encountered it one day at an old, abandoned house far back in the woods. It was stooping down, he said, looking out the window at him. Then he fired on it, and in that same instant, it just vanished right before his eyes. Shaken by the sighting, he went home where he dared not mention the incident to anyone, not even his wife. He didn't give up, however, and eventually claimed to have found trace evidence in the form of hair, a claw, 
and plaster casts of a partial footprint left in near-frozen ground. The print, though, incomplete, was impressive and showed the clear impression of a large four-toed foot. When the news coverage began, Dad referred the reporters up to talk to the neighbor, which they did. His name appeared in print, and he, like my own family, suffered through an embarrassing period of public ridicule. We children were endlessly taunted at school, and the neighbor, who worked at a local fire department, fared much the same. Strange things were seen and heard for the next several months, but the events finally came to a conclusion for my family, at least when the neighbor told Dad about a bizarre encounter with the creature he had experienced a couple of weeks prior, followed by a short stay in the hospital. He had been looking for the thing one day, he said, when it started to rain. He was walking a tree line at the time, and there was a nearby, long-abandoned old barn into which he went seeking shelter from the rain. Little did he know, the creature was also inside. He stood for only a moment, one end of the open-ended barn, when suddenly the feeling that he wasn't alone washed over him, and the often-described sensation of the hair rising on the back of the witness's neck and arms, he slowly turned around and found himself staring into a huge, hairy midsection. He stood six foot three tall, but he had to look almost straight up to see the creature's face. It was a horrible sight and deeply unsettling. With the short muzzle, long pointed fangs set into both of its upper and lower jaws, black skin and strange red eyes that chilled and frightened him to his very soul. He reached for the rifle strapped on his shoulder, but suddenly found himself unable to move as those terrible eyes froze him in their gaze. Roy thought he was surely done for, but despite the beast's alarming appearance, it spoke to him without using its mouth at all, but some sort of mental telepathy and said, Don't be afraid. I will not harm you. Then it turned around and ran out the end of the barn that was facing the open, well-plowed field, now muddy from the rain. It was a few moments before he could move again, he said, but at last, he was able to shake his head and clear the vision of those red, burning eyes from his mind. When he had composed himself somewhat, he walked to the door through which the creature had run, hoping to see for the first time the creature's track in the muddy field. There was none. Dad, realizing this was no ordinary monster, asked Roy if he thought it might come up one night and try to steal one of the children. The man replied that it was not likely, as they had been there for nearly a year already, and the thing seemed content with killing the animals and merely scaring the people. But he told him if the creature ever did decide to do that, there would be nothing anyone in this world could do for them. They would be gone, period. For weeks, Dad had kept a five-gallon bucket of kerosene and a mop near the kitchen door, in case the creature tried to get in and attack the members of the household. In the event that he could not drive it away with bullets or fire, it was his intention to kick the bucket of fuel over and set it ablaze, burning the house to the ground with the whole family inside rather than losing one or more of us to the creature and trying to live with the loss. Better, he reasoned, that we should all die and go to heaven together than trying to live without a single member of the family. All of us had agreed. Soon after the talk with the neighbor, we found ourselves once again, picking up our belongings and moving back to the safety of the city. It's interesting to note that the description given of the beast vary from the classic Bigfoot description to one more akin to the dogman phenomena and seem to describe the appearance of two unknown humanoids in the same area at the same time. As an adult, I interviewed Roy, the neighbor, and my father's friend. What he told me about his further encounters with the Spotsville monster astounded me. He claimed that he had seen the beast several more times after my family left. Moreover, he said that what he had seen with his own eyes went far beyond anything that he had ever dreamed possible. One day, he was walking along an old fence line next to a field and noticed a strange area that looked like heat waves rising from a hot summer road. 
the area was only a few yards wide, and to either side, everything looked normal. According to Roy, as he was watching, one of the creatures stepped out of this strange, wavy area like stepping out of a doorway. One second, nothing, and the next, it was there, looking right at him. It growled at him, and at the same time, screamed inside his head to leave me alone. Then it turned around and took a step back into the strange-looking doorway and disappeared. After that, he began watching the same area from a distance using binoculars as often as he could. In all, he claimed to have witnessed several different monsters using this doorway a total of three different times, always appearing or disappearing seemingly into thin air. These strange creatures would then be seen crossing his own property and tripping the sensitive motion-detecting security lights in his yard. When asked if I could see the trace evidence, I received another revelation. After the media coverage back when we were kids, he said he was visited by the state police and a couple of other men whom he took to be DNR officials. He was shocked when they demanded that he turn over all of his evidence concerning the thoughtful monster to them immediately, which he did. Moreover, they stated that if he ever talked to anyone else about the subject, especially the media, he would be arrested without hesitation and thrown into prison on a made-up charge and would never see his wife and two young daughters again unless it was looking at them through prison bars. In addition, a statement had been prepared for the local newspaper in his name, stating for a fact that what he had seen was nothing more than a large black bear. Not easily intimidated, he at first balked at the whole thing, reasoning that this was America and his rights were being grossly violated. But the officials were very persuasive, and in the end, he had little choice but to go along with the charade for the sake of his family. Over the years, he had tried to get the item back with no luck. One time, he and his family came home and found a large freezer bag on the front porch. It held the remains of its plaster cast smashed into powder. The statement was released to the local paper, which proudly proclaimed the mystery of the Spotsville monster solved. The hordes of monster hunters melted away, leaving behind only the body of a dog, someone's family pet, accidentally shot by monster hunting teens. Everything quieted down, and the Spotsville monster faded into memory. Roy never talked of his experiences again with anyone but me and still fears those threats made all those years ago to this day, as he now owns a successful business and does not wish to jeopardize it. He blames the inability to speak of his encounter on a heart attack he suffered, which left him for a brief time before he was resurrected clinically dead. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!